They just said, you're no better than anybody else. So he says, oh, really? Watch, we'll get water out of this rock. He didn't mean to say, we, not God. Rather, we, not you. Yeah, you think Moses doesn't deserve what God did. Oh, no, he doesn't deserve it. But God was right. Uh -huh. Because had he done, gotten away with that and gotten them into Israel, they would have worshipped him. That's why he's buried where no man can find him, so that he will never be worshipped. He really is pro Moses. Yeah, that's yeah, for that's sure. Right. And pro that's God, by the way. Yeah. 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 I just want to make that clear. Thank you for joining us as we journey through the great book of Exodus. And thank you very much to the DW Plus crew for having the vision and generosity of spirit to make this Exodus seminar produced at no small cost and substantial risk freely available to all who are interested on YouTube. Perhaps you might consider a Daily Wire Plus subscription. It's a bastion of free speech. And we have great content there with much more to come. We journeyed to Athens, Rome, and Jerusalem to film a four-part documentary series on Western civilization and have additionally recorded specials on marriage, vision, the pitfalls and opportunities for adventure and masculinity, all of which are exclusively available there. These join many of the Beyond Order public lectures that made up my recent tour and my extensive back catalog, fully uncensored. Onward and upward. Hello everyone, I'm pleased and disappointed to announce that this is the last episode of the Exodus Seminar. Pleased because we are coming to an end and by the looks of things a successful end and disappointed because it's been great fun and very deep and meaningful process and so there's some sadness in it coming to an end. So, uh, but having said that, we're going to continue our journey uh, and, and we'll begin with what we talked about yesterday. So let me catch everybody up about where we are in the seminar and also where the Israelites are. Um, we're just finishing off numbers, moving to Deuteronomy, and that's where we'll end. And uh, we left the Israelites in the following condition. So the covenant of the second tablets has been established. We talked about that a little bit. The, the first set of commandments inscribed on stone looked like they were a bit harsh or the Israelites couldn't live up to them. You know, you can int interpret it one way or another. They were dashed, uh, and the Israelites started to worship false idols. And the second covenant, or the, a, na a new covenant, was reannounced with new tablets, perhaps a uh, slightly less stringent set of requirements from the divine, and perhaps a bit more goodwill on the part of the Israelites. Remains to be seen. But, and that means the state of Israel has been established now. Now, that, nonetheless, the Israelites are still in the desert. Now, they've established a state, and they kind of got themselves together, so they're not complete slaves anymore, and they've set up a subsidiary structure that actually serves their purposes quite well. But that doesn't mean they're satisfied, and the text indicates that they start to murmur, which means to complain resentfully, essentially, and also that they engender within themselves something like arbitrary lust. So they, they get kind of hyper-consumer. That's a good way of thinking about it. They get greedy and impulsive. And maybe that's one of the temptations that's, that falls prey once a successful state is established. In any case, God isn't very happy with that, and he, he threatens them with annihilation once again, and Moses intercedes on their behalf, and we have a reestablishment of something like the principle of subsidiarity, and God agrees that he's going to abide by his covenant, even though the people have deviated. And then that's complicated by the fact that Remember now, the Israelites are moving out to the Promised Land, right? So that's the uniting vision. That's, that's, that's the vision that's giving them hope, literally, and uniting them and preserving them from anxiety. And they send scouts out to Canaan, spies from each of the tribes, and they come back, and there's some disagreement about whether or not this movement forward is actually a good idea. And some people say, yeah, the land is as rich as God promised, and other people say, yeah, but the... The people who are going to be set against us are much more powerful than we thought, and this is far too dangerous, and so now there's a fractionation of vision within the land. 
And uh, that's basically where we're at. And um, God, as a consequence of the faithlessness of the people, essentially announces to them that the people who are alive now will not see the promised land, that they're going to be wandering in the desert for longer than they thought, and that's because they've lost this integrity of guiding vision and are questioning the covenant. And, uh, and, and that's essentially where we left off. And Jonathan, you were going to comment about God's comments. Um, in <laughs> I, I also want to comment on structure in terms of literary structure to notice what it is that's happening. And... Um, so if you look at the story in Genesis from the fall to the flood, you have this fall from Edenic place. They, they go down the mountain. Because of the sins of Cain, they develop cities and civilization. That leads to monsters and giants. And then that leads to water, which is the, 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 the flood and the end of the world. So that structure is a structure that is universal, right? You can think about it in terms of a story, in terms of time. You can think about it also in terms of a phenomenological description of how any identity sees themselves. And so the Greeks, they had the omphalos, right? They had the middle, they had the, the, the belly button of the world. And then they had strangers further and further from them. And the further you went, the stranger they were until you got monsters and giants on the edge of the world. And then on the edge of that, you have the great ocean, which is like the, really the end of the world in that sense. Okay, So now what we've got is we've got Israel basically wants to go and back to Eden is the way to understand it. The promised land is an image of Eden. And so the structure of how they're going to go back to Eden will appear as backtracking the fall. And so they, they, what, what they, they're coming is they're coming up to the Jordan. There's a river. There's, they have to do a river crossing, right? And when they finally do cross it, it'll really be even like the water is going to split. The Ark of the Covenant, like the Ark of Moses, is going to cross over the, the waters. And then what do you need on the other side? You need giants. <laughs> it's like giants are there before you're able to get to Eden. So they're going to see giants, and then later they're, they're going to defeat a first city, which is this image of the, the, the city, and that is how they kind of begin their entry into the, into the Promised Land. So you can really see how beautifully structured the whole narrative is as they kind of go back. And this is something, this, this type of, of storytelling is there everywhere. If you look at Jeffrey Monmouth, the first people that come to Britain, what do they have to do? They have to fight giants, you know, and it's a universal mythological story of that which is, let's say, the, the world that was before us usually is made up of giants and you have to conquer them in order to start up a new world. Whether it's like the Scandinavian, uh, Scandinavian uh, Eddas have that same structure, the frost giants. Uh, I mean, it's just, I could go through well, all the Well, they're the, the prince, those giants are the, un you could think about them as the underlying principles of the state that is now going to be conquered. Because when you encounter a people, you just don't encounter their soldiers. You encounter the whole landscape of the ideas that animate them. And those are giants. And sometimes, I mean, I often think Rome died of indigestion because, and you could say, well, it consumed so many giants that they went to war in the stomach of Rome and then tore it apart. Right? They couldn't digest that, that, that the culture, because the culture isn't just the fragmented individuals that make it up. There's these gigantic principles operating yeah. behind the scene. And usually it's, a, it's almost the also the image of a remainder. It's not just the culture. It's like this, this culture that has become too heavy in its body, right? It's, it's like an excess of body, you could say. A lack of head. You know that image you have of the, you know, the, the giant that has a, a dwarf on his shoulders that's moving him around? That's the image. Like, too much body, not enough mind left. And so it's, yeah. All right. So I thought we, we could, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about Numbers 15. There's a bit of a reference here to to the idea of the fringe, and that's very relevant. So, do, do you, all of you remember that famous, I believe it was a New Yorker cover, which was the world view of a New Yorker? Yes. And so there was, there's New York, and then there's some streets laid out, 52nd Street, and then you can see New York, and then there's New York State, and then after that there's flyover country, basically, and then, you know, the land of the monsters. And it was a real iconic cover. And the reason for that is it has exactly this structure. And, and the reason that our that our systems of apprehension have this structure is because even our visual perception has this structure. Mm -hmm. you, you point your eyes with the highest resolution part of your eye. That's the fovea. And then the way the visual system is structured is that it's very intense and high resolution right at the center, but that takes a lot of brain power. And then you have concentric rings 
that shade into each other around that center until finally about out here you don't even see in color and you don't see shapes you see vague shapes and then it it fades into blackness itself or in, into non-being really beyond blackness and so what that means is that even every el aspect of an elementary perception has exactly the same structure a sacred center that's that defines the unifying point of the perception that fades out into the fringes along the edges and so that's why what Jonathan says as described so beautifully at the mythological level is is recapitulated as we've discussed already at the at the political level and at the anthropological level ultimately we we have uh, affections for what is closest to yes, us to, yes. our, to our neighbors and then there are these concentric circles of affection that just do get progressively weaker mm -hmm. as you get to the outermost limits mm -hmm. we are we are finite in the loves and the affections and the loyalties that we can we can owe uh, and this is why at the sort of political level it's it's the Burkean platoons and the Tocqueville's associations which is that's where you need that's where you need to start it's not to say that it's not possible to think of ourselves as a global community mm -hmm. but that is always going to be the, the what commands the weakest form of loyalty and affection well it also takes a tremendous amount of work like if you walk into a novel visual landscape mm -hmm. you can point your eyes everywhere and make a detailed map but it takes an awful lot of effort right to because you might say well maybe the ultimate goal would be to shine as much light on the periphery as you can shine on the center it's like yeah well that might be the ultimate goal but there's a hell of a lot of periphery and not that much center that's right. and so that that's a big it's a big technical problem you know imagine how much energy you'd have to have to love your enemy the same way you love your children that's very very difficult to or the multitude for that matter you know that's and that's an exhausting enterprise there's so, a desire today to get rid of the concentric circles mm -hmm. I'll give you an example I, I I'd be shocked if any of you know of this example but a few years ago the producers of the Superman comic had Superman stand in front of the United Nations and announced that he was no longer an American citizen, but was a citizen of the world. Right, 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 right. Well, yeah, well, the thing is, the, the reason that that's happening to some degree is people confuse uh, compassionate inclusion with lack of differentiation, right? And I think it really is because we don't have a good sense in our culture of the necessity of a subsidiary uh, structure. We don't have a good sense that it is Mount Sinai in, in the terminology that you've been using in particular, Jonathan, to hold us together. Right? We have no idea that a unity of purpose is a precondition even for an act of visual perception. So we confuse the, this concentric structure with something like discrimination. And you can kind of understand that because outsiders are outside and there's a certain pain in that. But if, if you understand that if you blow out the concentric circles, that the Mount Sinai, that all you're left with is either tyranny or chaos, then that's obviously not a very good solution. Mm. Well, I was going to say, yeah, it, the confusion is that, that equality, true equality of, in human dignity, equality before the law, is simply understood as, as sameness, a flat, yes. undifferentiated homogeneity. The idea that there could be you know, different functions, people with different talents, uh, equal regardless of their particular differences, is, is one that's very difficult for the modern mind to, right. to grip. Right, well, we stress the diversity and without noting that for that diversity to exist in harmony, there has to be a, 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 very, a, a, a variegated unity. Exactly. A absolutely. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's a movement also into vagueness, right? It's, there's such a constant um, uh, alarm sounded for vagueness. Mm. Right, and as we keep moving into the abstract, then that's where ideology can easily creep in because mm -hmm. you need to grab the vague. And so how do you mm -hmm. grab the vague as you kind of ossify it into something ideological? Well, well, yeah. But it's, it's blurry and out of focus. Well, and that, so would be of the call, that would be the call to tyranny that's part and parcel of the descent into chaos. Is you can't tolerate the descent into chaos and that vagueness. It doesn't work psychologically. And so even if you're, your motive to demolish the concentric hierarchy is something like a vision of diversity, it will lead you, leave you in the desert and there will be an unconscious call for something like a tyrannical unity. And that's, that's partly why we get idol worship in this, as a, emerging as a temptation. And isn't there an irony here that for all the insistence upon equality, the very foundation for that equality in Western culture, i.e. the idea that <clears throat> human beings are made in the imago Dei, in the image of God, has been lost, of mm -hmm. course. So it's almost as if, because of the erosion of this foundation, 
the drive for equality is stressed yeah. all the more. Well, that's that's it, exactly what Nietzsche. That's exactly what Nietzsche claimed would happen when he wrote. Well, when he's particularly in Beyond Good and Evil, he said that was that was an inevitable. That would be an inevitable consequence. Dennis, then oh, Stephen. Oh, I, I, it's funny that you call on me. I, 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 I. I it's like you were reading my mind, because I didn't signal I wanted to say anything, but I'm just curious on, on Nietzsche, because uh, you so often cite him, and, and, and I don't know nearly as much as you do about him. Just in a nutshell, do you feel he has an unfair reputation? Um, I'm a great admirer of Nietzsche. I think, I think Nietzsche made, a, he made two fundamental errors. He identified Christianity with slave morality as such, and identified it as a revolt of the weak against the strong. Now, the, the thing is, Nietzsche knew that there was a strain, I would say, in Protestant liberalism that was going to elevate and glorify victimization. But, but he conflated that with Christianity itself. Now, it's complex, because Nietzsche was a great admirer of the Old Testament, and he often appears as a great admirer of Christ. But he's not an admirer of, say, carelessly institutionalized Christianity. And, and he was grappling with this problem that the elevation of the victim was going to become a cataclysm. And so he's complicated, you know. And I also think of him as a beneficial critic of Christianity in, in some sense. But it's unfair. He's like, people think in the public mind, to the extent they know him, they think he's a proto-Nazi. Yeah, well, his sister, who got a hold of his notebooks after he, he, he was dead, married a very well-known and prominent anti-Semite and edited Nietzsche's texts in a way that, that tilted it towards something that the Nazis could eventually use. Though Nietzsche made explicit comments continually about the pathology of anti-Semitism. He was not happy with that at all. Now the other mistake Nietzsche made, which was a big one, and maybe the biggest mistake, was that he believed that people could create their own values. Now he thought a new type of man would have to come into being to do that. And then the psychoanalysts. Was that the Ubermensch? That's that the Ubermensch, yeah. And, and Nietzsche also talked about the will to power. And dimwit fascists think about that as power. But that isn't what Nietzsche meant. What Nietzsche actually meant was something like that life was oriented around a driving force to the kind of unity that we've been talking about that has to even bind perception. And Nietzsche described that as, as what's been translated in English as will to power, but he didn't mean by power use of compulsion and force, but the Nazi interpreters of Nietzsche certainly interpreted it in that manner. And he was so, the son of a Lutheran pastor. Right. And, mm. and when Bach's Matthew Passion was performed in Basel, because it was lost for a long time, it was rediscovered, and then performed in Basel, and Nietzsche wept publicly right. at the performance mm. of the Matthew mm passion. So it's ironic that this uh, most celebrated atheist of, uh, of the, the recent period should, um, uh, yeah, should have been weeping. At I think the it's, it's, it's worth saying as well in, in the context of Nietzsche that he does pay both Judaism and Christianity the backhanded compliment of assuming that morality, a moral order, a, moral, a morally patterned universe goes hand in hand, is kind of cons completely complicit with a commitment to uh, monotheism. And, and he's absolutely clear yeah. about that. So yeah. when Nietzsche announces the death of God, and thus speaks Zarathustra, it is not triumphant. He says, we will never, essentially, we will never get enough water to wash away the blood. So he, he understands that this, is a that this is a cataclysm. He says, all that is holy has now bled to death under our knives. So. If one were to read one of his works, while Beyond Good and Evil. That's what I thought. Yeah, not, okay. not Thus Speaks Zarathustra. Yeah, Beyond Good and Evil. I just wanted to make a, <clears throat> a brief comment about the sort of thir 13 and 14, the spies going up. <clears throat> it seems to me there's something very powerful psychologically to draw from this, and that this is a really key moment in the text. We were talking about they're not being able to enter the Promised Land. So what's happened here is that the, you know, the spies have gone up and they've come back, and you know, Caleb says... It's great. The land is ready there for the taking. We can do it, you know. And the others with him, they don't just say, "Well, it's harder than you think," or something. They actually, they, they actually lie about what they've seen. They 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 dishonestly represent what they've seen on this. What was you might say should have been further delineating the ideal or the goal. In fact, they travesty that. They they betray it. And as a result of that, the the Israelites uh, are not able to enter, and so you know one can read that and say, "Well, God is a bit of a bit of a hard ass or whatever." Uh, but in fact, I would I think we, we've been saying so often in the last last while, 
in fact, this is descriptive. And I've been mm -hmm. thinking about this mm -hmm. psychologically since we read this yesterday. You know, what does this mean? And, you know, we're all, let's say, and Jordan, you're so good at, at, at helping people see this. You know, we're all called to be, you know, a, a higher, better, deeper, fuller version of what we are in potential. That's, it, 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 it's there. And, and it's going to be difficult. It's going to take humility and perseverance and, and who knows what else in each of our particular ways. Um, but I think we do this to our, certainly, I, I think we do this to ourselves. You know, we, we, we see the difficulty of the way, mm -hmm. and we, we get discouraged, and we, we tell ourselves, or there's a risk that we tell ourselves at least, that we're, oh, I, I'm not made for that. That's not what I, that's not what I should be, that's not what I can become. We self-servingly <laughs> exaggerate the obstacles. Yes, and I think, I, I think mm -hmm. it's so important to listen to what are the voices you allow in your head. I mean, is it Caleb or is it the grumblers? Yeah. Because it makes all the difference of whether you are able to have your potential realized. And so that, and it seems to me that the, the dominant nihilism of our age is precisely that kind of grumbling to take away, no, you're not made for anything. There is no higher sphere, yeah. period. And this is what comes out of that, that, that tradition we were just talking about now. And so I think it's worth thinking about what the psychological dimension of this, because of course the whole well, of Exodus, you've, you've in a way, is, a, is the answer to that problem. Well, you've got a, <clears throat> you've got something that's very key to this part of the of the narrative structure, because now the state's been established, and the Israelites are actually not doing too bad, even though they're in the desert. And so, as you said, now when you're in that situation, the battle in your own mind, and this is a dialogical battle between different camps of personality in a real in a real way, is do we move forward forthrightly? in accordance with our vision, even though we may have to battle giants along the way, or do we fall prey to the murmuring, to the lusts, to the nihilism, to the discontent, and to those who are discontented, and allow ourselves to be knocked off the track? And we face that, everyone I think faces that within the confines of their own psyche, within there, their family, all the time. There's another piece here I was thinking about when you were talking, Stephen, and that is we've arrived at a point where they're lying backwards and they're lying forwards or prevaricating, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Oh, remember Egypt? Remember how mm -hmm. glorifying that was? Oh, look at the size and the numbers of what's ahead. Mm -hmm. And so they're unhooked. They're unhooked from history. They're unhooked from the past and they're unhooked moving forward and they're in succession. Yeah. Yeah. So they're floating, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, and part of that being unhooked from the past would be, and, and, the, and the vision of the future, is they're also starting to sacrifice the vertical element because the vertical element of orientation is at least as in part alignment with the glorious tradition of the past, but also in alignment with the divine vision of the future. And that's it, where we're seeing Moses, right? It goes to the 70 below Moses, yeah. right? So all the connections, right? Honesty about the past, right? A clear eye towards what should be hindsight, a clear vision of the reality of the obstacles ahead. You're not going to overinflate them, you're not going to underestimate them. And also the relationship up, which is direct mm -hmm. to Moses, they're starting to disintegrate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not arbitrary. You're, Jordan, you're, one of your lines is, you know, truth is the antidote to suffering, if I'm not, not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And that, and that, that, but that is true. This is not just, oh, well, tell yourself a different story right, or something. Right. No, this is true, and mm -hmm. this is false. And so the renewing of the mind in relation to the, 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 the higher principle for which you are made and which is the, you might say, the nature, the actual nature of things is, you might say, the, the, the antidote to our own self-delusion. Mm -hmm. okay. A word on Caleb. Caleb is another non-Hebrew stock hero in the Torah. It's, Yehosh, it's um, Kalev ben Yefuneh HaKnizi. Caleb, the son of Yefuneh or Jefuneh, the Kenizzite. Hmm. The Torah goes out of its way to tell you this is not a Hebrew. Oh, so it's Hebrew another stock. another noble outsider. So you have the daughter of Pharaoh, you have Noah, you have Jethro, and you have and you have Caleb, one of the only two spies to say we we can conquer Canaan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The 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 non-Jewish stock hmm. here. So he's like the grateful immigrant. Yeah, mm. yeah. and absolutely, mm -hmm. which of which we need more. Right, right, but right, the. Right. Uh, I just again want to note the Jews come out pretty poorly in the Torah. Right, right. The non Jews yep, yep. come out quite well. Yep, yep. Yeah. I want to just point out just one last sorry, little yep, thing just yep. for, for people who love the this the beautiful structure of, of how the text lays itself out. One of the possible readings of the name Kalev is dog. And so you have Joshua and the dog, the Kenizzite who take over Canaan. And then if and he and and Caleb gets the edge of the camp. He gets the periphery of the camp. He's not a he's not a he's not an Israelite. And so, flash forward to Christ. There's a little 
wordplay and game happening with Christ when he encounters the Canaanite woman who comes to him and asks Christ, and Christ says, you know, do not give to, 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 do not give to the dogs that which goes to the children. And then he ultimately says, like, I have not seen such faith. You know, right. as in her. Yeah, because she says the dogs can eat. And at she least says, the dogs can eat the crumbs. The crumbs which are fall off the edge of the table. Right. And right. she's referring directly to this story. I think to Caleb, who gets the edge, and who is the one one of the people that came in with faith into the land. So all these subtle references in the New Testament. Right. right. And the, and these are the these are the two who who produce the positive report. And so it's the it's the it's, it's this unity of the center and the fringe I as well so. that are represented. That's right. Well, that's I think worth, so. It's worth thinking about. Oz. If you read the whole story first, at least for me, you think the golden calf is far worse. It's the big rebellion. But clearly this one is actually just as bad for the Jews. Is that not right? Mm -hmm. Because the punishment, only 3,000 die after the golden calf. An entire adult generation dies off before they can go on. Mm -hmm. Presumably because... They're skeptical about the promised land. The Lord had promised it, yeah, and they doubted it. Yeah. Well, we have that we have that problem in our culture right now because everybody is so dubious about the future, right? Yeah. We don't have a uniting vision of the future, and to the degree that there is a uniting vision, it's really a vision of timidity in relationship to the impending apocalypse. Yeah. In a society rife with anti-religious ideologies, it can be incredibly challenging to ground oneself in what you know to be true and good. To keep from descending into distrust, you need to check out Hallow, the number one prayer app in the world with over 10,000 audio guided prayers and meditations that will give you the tools to combat the darkness and overcome with the light. With Hallow, you can explore different themes and types of prayer and meditation, such as gratitude, forgiveness, and centering prayer. You can also choose from different lengths of meditation to fit your schedule, whether you have a few minutes or an hour. With its user-friendly interface and hundreds of guided meditations, the Hallow app has quickly become a go-to resource for people seeking spiritual growth and healing. Download the app for free at hallow.com slash exodus. You can set reminders and track your progress along the way. So what are you waiting for? Download the Hallow app at hallow.com slash exodus. That's hallow.com slash exodus. Hallow.com slash Exodus for an exclusive three-month free trial of all 10,000 plus prayers and meditations. But there's something of Noah, by the way, in this, what's going on, right? The whole generation has to pass, and Noah with his animals cross over the water into the promised land. And, and I think that's also part of, of, of Joshua and Caleb. Mm -hmm. the Purifying of the people. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Forgive me for they cross the one water. last yeah. yeah. but... Yeah. Um, this, you raised this question of Nietzsche, um, and there's actually a great anti-Semite in 19th century culture, uh, and an anti-Semite in an intellectual sense, I don't mean, and I, I don't Wagner. know this, but, well, no, Wagner's, one of Wagner's mentors in the sense of Schopenhauer. So Schopenhauer attacks uh, the Semitic religions, what he thinks of as the Semitic religions, and he thinks of, the, of, of Judaism and Islam. And he says these are uh, idiotic religions because they're life-affirming. And he's been deeply influenced by what he takes to be Indian religion. I mean, it's, it's rather uh, an imperfect knowledge that he has given the period, but it's a sort of form of Buddhism, right? Mm -hmm. So he thinks the the antidote to suffering is resignation right, right, yeah right. and the uh, the great mistake of both Judaism and Islam is thinking that the world is a good place because it has been created by a good God. Now, interestingly, mm -hmm. Schopenhauer thinks that Christianity is a halfway house. Mm -hmm. He says he thinks there's an element of this bad uh, Hebraic tradition in Christianity, but. Christianity, fortunately, was influenced by something more Indian, a, a, a renunciatory tradition, you know, monasticism and, uh, and that, that mm -hmm. sort of side. Now, in a way, Nietzsche's emphasis upon life affirmation mm -hmm. is, a, is a critique of Schopenhauer. Right, um, right, right. And I think one of the questions I think that's interesting to think of here is, to, is um, you know, 
what is the nature of this life-affirming dimension mm -hmm. to the book of mm -hmm. Exodus? Mm -hmm. This will come well, back and to Jewish thinking course. in general exactly. with this emphasis on life more abundant. It's a very mm -hmm. pro-human ethos. Choose right. life. Mm -hmm. We'll see this mm -hmm. soon, won't we, in mm -hmm. Deuteronomy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, so fringes, fringes. Numbers 15. Um, this is an indication of how these narrative tropes play out in something more concrete. And the Lord, this is 1537. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a riband of blue, and it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you used to go a-warring. So, that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. And so, Jonathan, you want to make a, like a closing comment for now on the idea of, of fringes? Yeah. No, I think that it's very important. I think that the notion of fringes is probably one of the, the categories of existence that we should understand today. Because in some ways we are obsessed with it, but we mm -hmm. don't completely understand what the function of the fringe is. And, and if we did, I think we could help to heal some of the issues that are, that are happening. We tend to go into extremes like the chaos and order, and the fringe is actually space on the edge of the world for things to be left vague, mm -hmm. right? It's that space on the edge of perception that we kind of accept that things are... It's so not it's, clear there. Exactly. It's the monsters hidden in the border. You see that, like we've talked about before, on the uh, outside of churches, gargoyles, medieval manuscripts, they would have all kinds of irony and monsters and mixtures in the borders of the manuscript. So you'd actually have like the text of the gospel, and then in the border, you'd have, you know, rabbits fighting knights and snails, you know, all this kind of all this kind of humor and, and chaos on the edge. A um, carnival. On yeah, the and so there's the ver there's also the, the corners of the field that should not be tilled as part of that, you know, for the stranger, leaving room for the stranger in your land as right, well, right. Uh, not kind of cutting off your ethnic mm -hmm. group completely. And there's a strange, there's a tradition, uh, and I don't know, Dennis, if you, if you know about this, but there's a, there's a tradition that, that the fringe, it doesn't say this in the text, but that the fringe ultimately actually comes to be made for some groups out in, in, in modern Judaism, or let's say medieval Judaism, out of uh, linen and wool together. And so That's the, only the priest. Only the priest. And so the mixture that is forbidden in the text... That's right, it's forbidden, yes. It's, it's allowed on the fringe. Yep. Right. Yeah, well, this is so... I think this is so interesting psychologically because one of the problems of perception technically is, well, one concept has to be bordered by another. This is, a, this is a problem that Derrida really tried to go after because yes. he was very concerned with the fringe. He thought the fringe should be brought to the center. That's why he thought that the Western phallogocentrism should be upended and reversed. He wanted to bring the, the margin and the yeah. fringe well, to the center. He understood how the, how the fringe he, is a, has a parasitic element if you're not careful because ambiguity can devour categories if you mm -hmm. let it rampant. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of keeping it on the fringe is to understand that there is ambiguity, but it, it has to be at the bottom of the mountain, you could say. Yeah. Right? Whereas Derrida, using oppositional thinking, if you think of, it's like black and white, and then you say, wait a minute, what's this gray? And then everybody starts to lose their mind because yeah. they thought everything was just black and white. Yeah. So he used that in a way to expand the category of, of strangeness and the category of ambiguity to devour parasitically the categories. Well, he kind of thought, as far as I could tell, that the fact that there were monsters on the fringe meant that the category, that the category system was dangerously incomplete and also oppressive and patriarchal. So I don't think Der Derrida understood that, that dichotomy no, the gradations between unity and fringe had to be maintained, and that that wasn't the fact that there was a united center and a fringe wasn't merely a consequence of the overlay of a tyrannical patriarchal structure, but a necessity for perception and hierarchical order itself. How do you understand that in terms of freedom and liberty? I mean, Tsar Alexandro is described as uh, the Tsar with a telegraph, but although he was autocratic. The Russian Empire was so big that what the little peasant did out on the frontiers, it didn't matter. Right. Xi Jinping is described as the same Tsar with a computer. 
Right. Now, as today, you can drive well, right well, to the edges with look, reason, technological well, surveillance. Part, of the, reason, and so part of the reason that cash is so valuable as a social phenomenon is that you can't keep track uh, of it. Yeah, right. Absolutely. It allows fringe enterprises, and you say, well, that'll facilitate criminality. People make the same comment about Bitcoin. Yeah. But it's like, well, yeah, if you get rid of all the criminals, you probably get rid of all the freedom, too. So there has to be this necessity for things. It's like the cleft of the rock that, in some ways, the, the fringe has to be able to hide from the all-seeing gaze of the uniting of the uniting principle, or there's no possibility for, for freedom. Great. Well, for me, what's so interesting is, you know, we think about conservatism and liberalism through the strain of big five, right? Degree of openness mm -hmm. is a heavy correlation. High openness tends to be liberal. It's, it's a somewhat fixed trait. So we know to some extent whether you view that as evolutionarily determined or God-given, we have a necessity to see, thing both, to see things both ways, right? We need walls protecting insider groups yeah. from outsider groups. If there are two rigid and unporous new ideas and people won't get in and will yeah. perish and yeah. die. I'm, I'm reading this now, being somebody who comes from a secular tradition, right, and I'm in, in, in transit as we all are in terms of, of figuring out differing meaning. It's, it's so um, illuminating for me how many, con how many times a text which one would identify as inherently conservative makes room for all of this, mm -hmm. makes room for the Ethiopian wife, mm -hmm. makes room mm -hmm. for um, Caleb is how mm -hmm. I'm, I'm accustomed to pronouncing the name. Mm -hmm. and, and that the Pharaoh's rigidity, right, and his inability to allow, right, when, when yeah. the slaves are asking for something, it's like make them gather their own straw now. That if you resist, if you grow angry in the <coughs> face of it, if you harden against those things, you're turn lily white as a joke, mm -hmm. right? And it's, there's a real dialogue in here yeah. about the necessity for both of those things. Mm -hmm. When it comes to well, your 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 observation is interesting too because you could say, extending this argument, that the political dialogue in the West, when it's conducted properly, is something like the dialogue between those who stand for the unity of the center and those who stand for the necessity of the fringe, and that that always has to be negotiated because as things transform across time, which they have to inevitably the relationship between the United Center and the fringe has to be somewhat dynamic. And I think the only way we maintain that, well, this is why free speech is so important, is the only way we can retain that dynamic unity is by engaging in a conversation between those yes. who stand for the fringe and those who it's, stand for the it's center. It's driving a car, right? And so liberalism, proper liberalism, is the gas. Like, you, we got to get somewhere new, and conservatism is the brake. And mm -hmm. if you have one, you stand on it and you go nowhere, and everyone's stubborn and crosses their arms, mm -hmm. and the other goes flying off cliffs or into brick walls. Mm -hmm. And so there's a careful negotiation mm -hmm. that's a necessity between both perspectives. And it's been it's been captivating for me, because Pajot is the... Is the been the expert of the fringe on this, yeah. right, in the discussion of the monsters and the different kinds of monsters. A mm -hmm. monster of too muchness, that's a that's a conservative monster. Mm -hmm. A monster of too a monster of too much hybridization is a liberal monster. And mm -hmm. it's like right. you don't right. want either of those. Right. Right. Both of those things lead to ill. Right. Mm -hmm. Well this is kind of connected to Greg's point. And I don't want to go against Pajot's expertise on, on the fringes as kind of symbolic of as chaos of, of chaos. But it's striking that the, the color is blue. And blue is typically the sort of symbolic of, of God, of heaven, yeah. royalty. Loyalty. Royalty. 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 Of course. Yeah. Royalty. That's Absolutely. what the blue is about. Well, Every Jew is, is, is a member of the kingdom of priests. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. I wonder if there's, some, there's, there's another dimension here. Well, that, that, because there's the there two fringes, by the way. Two fringes, right. There's okay. a crown. Yeah. A crown is also a fringe. Mm. Yeah. The king is also exceptional the other way. Right. And that's something I didn't want to bring into the conversation. It's difficult to understand. The, yeah. the king is not, how could I say, your king is not British. Yeah. Right? Your king, the king is, is not a citizen. The king is above, not a subject. The stands king above. Yeah. So the crown is actually a type of fringe, yeah. but it's a fringe moving up, and there's yeah. a fringe moving down. Yeah, Charles III doesn't really have a passport. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A, yeah. No, so, I mean, so, well, what, right. what it, artists are like that, right. by the way. What, 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 it, what it would say, yeah, and the king can't commit crimes, and mm -hmm. etc. But, so it seems as if the fringes, we, we can understand the fringes as somehow having a kind of constitutive power. I think it was Chesterton who, who said that to, to love anything is to love its limits. Mm -hmm. And the, the limits are, are, what, are what kind of are what create something. You, you understand right. its, its contours. You understand what it is. You can you can define it. You can delineate it. And so this is a. I think there's there's clearly a, a symbolism here going on. Just as they're on the point of, as it were, reaching the promised land, understanding what this little geographic slice of land is going to be, that they need to understand the importance 
of the fringes. Mm -hmm. They need to understand mm -hmm. what, 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 what are the well, limits that make also, the land. It, it also seems to me that there's, there's a relationship between the conceptualization of the inevitability and necessity of the fringe and the possibility of rationalizing mercy. It's like, well, if you know that, well, you need the unity because, well, we're lost in the desert and aimless without the unity. But the fringe is inevitable. And then you see, well, the fringe is the necessary mediator between categories. You don't, you can maintain your allegiance to the unity without becoming dangerously judgmental about the fact that, yeah. that not, it isn't just the fringe people who don't fit, because it's also the fringes within us, which is, I suppose, also what the clothing represents. It's like, you're going to deviate from the divine path continually, and if you were only a worshipper of the unity, let's say, in the perception, you just judge yourself out of existence constantly. So you have to allow for this, like you do with children, you have to allow for this ambiguity around the edges in order to not be a tyrant, even but to it, yourself. You can also see it as idiosyncrasy. So it's not just ambiguity, it's like we all have our own idiosyncrasy, let's say, but when we come and sit at the kitchen, at the family table, we don't bring our idiosyncrasies to the table. Mm -hmm. Just as, as we gather together in a common space to worship or to do something, we, we tend to bring that which can be bound together with others. It doesn't mean that our idiosyncrasies and our little habits and our little things don't exist. Mm -hmm. It's just that they remain on the fringe at mm -hmm. every level Where of reality. Should, they so should that's remain part on the of this process of proper subduing to keep the fringe, to not oppress the fringe out of existence, but to keep it in its proper place in relationship to, to Mount Sinai. It's worth noting that for Jews, this is literal. And, and you will see Orthodox Jews who do wear these fringes, strings, white strings that are hanging. The blue, as you pointed out, James, the blue represents royalty. And it was gotten from a very a rare type of snail, which has now been refound, as it were. And now Jews are resuming having Tehillet, this purple or blue. It's a royal blue. So I just want that people understand this was taken as as what the Torah says you will look on these fringes and remember to do my commandments mm -hmm. it's an ethical string around the finger a great story from the Talmud mm -hmm. a uh, the Talmud has everything in it and is it do you suppose it's as well is part of this text also the notion that you can look upon the fringes and you can appreciate the fact that they're there, but that shouldn't stop you from orienting yourself towards the, the central unity and the most fundamental analysis. N not just stop you, it should, it should push you there. Right, it should remind you? Yes, remind you. It, it, it's what it says, and you will remember. Mm -hmm. that, that's, what, that's the verb. So okay. here's a great story that illustrates the, the power of tzitzit, for the fringes. And it's amazing that it's even in the Talmud, because you would think of it as rather turgid or very scholarly and, and pious. So it has to do with a, uh, a young man who was a Torah student, and apparently he went one day to another town to visit a prostitute. And uh, as, uh, uh, as he was in front of her, he began undressing, and the Talmud says, as he got to his fringes, the tzitzit, they flew up and smacked him in the face. <laughs> At that point, he remembered why he is wearing the fringes, and he put his clothing back on. And the prostitute mm -hmm. said to him, do I not find favor in thine eyes? It was a very cultivated prostitute. <laughs> and, and, and he said, no, you, you do very much, but I am reminded by the fringes how I should act. She was so impressed, the Talmud says, she converted to Judaism, the and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> is that a great story? All right. All right. All right. Number 16, Korak's Rebellion. This is another extension of the internecine squabbling that's emerging among the, uh, among the Israelites. Now Korah, the son of Ijar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, Le Levi, and Dathan and Abraham, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, identifying them as part of a particular tribe, took men, and they rose up before Moses, with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said unto them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye 
up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do. Take you censers, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. You take too much upon you, you sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, Here I, play, I pray you, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. And he hath brought thee near to him and to all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee. And seek ye the priesthood also, for which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you murmur against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abraham, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? Except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. And Moses said unto Korah, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron, tomorrow, and take every man his censer, put incense in them, and bring you before the Lord of every man his censer, two hundred and fifty censers, Thou also, and Aaron, each of you his censer. And they took every man his censer, and put fire in them, and laid incense thereon, and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from, this con from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin? And wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abraham. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abraham, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan and Abraham, on every side, and Dathan and Abraham came out and stood in the doors of their tents, and their wives and their sons and their little children, and Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open up her mouth and swallow them up, with all that that appertaineth unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. Well, so, 
At the beginning of this story, the, re the rebels claim the same divine relationship that Moses claims, and they say, why do you put yourself above us? We're all equal, in the most fundamental sense, and you're not leading us anywhere good, not like Egypt, the land of milk and honey that we left. And so there's this internal rebellion, but there's an element of, it sort of starts off the rebellion with kind of an element of, I would say, prideful assumption, right? It's prideful assumption of self-proclaimed divinity. That the self-proclaimed is the important part. And so this, I think most people, if they, if they, if they pay attention to it in their lives, they will completely understand this text. Because on the one hand, we have this idea of equality, and we have this idea, it's, even in, in American Christianity, it's this idea of everybody's equal, mm -hmm. everybody's... But if you think about the manner in which any type of authority you know works, you will realize that authority can never be self-proclaimed. A policeman cannot self-proclaim himself a policeman. A judge cannot self-proclaim himself a judge. They have to receive their authority from above, and the legitimacy, the, the manner in which that legitimacy happens can vary, but they have to receive their legitimacy from the past, from the, the person before them, from something above. That has to be the case, or else you end up, if you self-name, then you end up in a world of tyrants and of, and of, uh, and of chaos. Mm -hmm. Well, fire from heaven and, and, and the, uh, the opening, opening up, up of the earth, right? right. Exactly. So the earth yeah. collapses and heaven descends in fire yeah. if you self-proclaim your authority. Yeah. To paraphrase yeah, well, that seems exactly our friend right. Oz, Korach is the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, and Sinai is the American Revolution. This is it. This is, this is how old we know of the notion that, A, there's nobody better than anybody else. Everybody has the same equality, which is phony. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Comrade Stalin, right? Yeah, they didn't right. call him president or first secretary. They comrade, mm -hmm. like we're all just comrades. Mm -hmm. Except, yeah. But, but some yeah. are more comrades than And the same, and the same from the French yeah. Revolution, as your, your brilliant book points out. I want to advertise your book. <laughs> it's, it's, so, it's so important. Th this, we're all this, brothers. this is the uh, what? We're all brothers. Right. Yes, yeah. we're, that's right. We're all or whatever the, that's right. Whatever the term. So, right. uh, this out of that radical egalitarianism necessarily springs tyranny. an implicit tyranny. Exactly. But, mm -hmm. I think it, it's not. It's not merely the self-proclamation. I mean, it's true that they're that that they have <clears throat> they are chosen, just as Aaron yeah. and Miriam, right? I mean, that's the difference between Aaron and Miriam and Moses. And same here, at some level, is not. It's not just that I'm proclaiming myself, it's that I, I am, as it were, taking res acting as though that which I am given, I created myself. And so mm -hmm. there's a sense in which there's a more profound betrayal of, that's why gratitude is the remedy to this, right? Because it's an inversion of gratitude. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a focus on, my, on myself. And this is the irony of Aaron and Miriam, which is, I think is quite parallel to this. The irony is that they're saying that what God has given them as if it is something they have done for themselves. And whereas Moses, who is the meekest man on the earth, is precisely defined by his, his wonderful sense that. of reception mm -hmm. to what he knows. And that's why here when this happens again, he falls on his face because he sees the calamity mm -hmm. of what they are doing. Two, mm -hmm. two quick mm -hmm. observations. One, Moses was slightly undone by wearing a t-shirt that said meekest man on earth all the time. <laughs> so it was, it was somewhat problematic. But the, there's a, I just want to marvel for a minute at the crime fiction, the, the, there's a great thriller line of dialogue from the Lord here when he says, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. It's so chilling, right? And the delivery that he's saying in front of everybody else, it's such a horrifyingly beautiful piece of dialogue in terms of um, generating that sort of, the kind of thrill that he's speaking about them in the third person in front of them and the kind of horror that runs through them that anticipates what's coming. We can also think, too, how hypocritical that claim of, of what dis discrimination-free universal brotherhood really is, because no one ever acts like that ever once in their life. I mean, if push comes to shove and you're in legal trouble, let's say, or you're in medical trouble, it's kind of the two broad classes of trouble, right? Biological trouble or social trouble. 
you're going to try to find the best lawyer. You're going to make the assumption that there's a hierarchy of competence, and even when you're trying to protect yourself, you're going to go for the person, the high, the person highest up in that authority chain that you can possibly find or afford. And, and that's even more the case if you're doing it on behalf of someone you love. So you can screech and, and squawk about the universal brotherhood of man eradicating all necessary distinctions, but there isn't a chance in hell that mm -hmm. you'll let... Well, and it's the same with regards to sexual, sexual selection. I mean, one of the things that I, I used to say to the students who came after me on the radical egalitarian front is like, no discrimination. It's like, well, you're, you're, what are you going to do? You're just going to lay down in the middle of the street and open your legs? Like, that's the plan? Because one of the things you do with sexual selection, obviously, when you choose a mate, it's the most discriminatory thing you ever do. It's like you exclude virtually everyone. You act as if there's a hierarchy of rank and desirability, and that there isn't anything more, there is no relationship that you enter into that's more fundamental than that. And it's certainly not one of universal access to all comers. That's for sure. We would regard that as the lowest possible form of behavior, and no one would ever do that. So when, when, they, when they dropped Mr. and Miss and Mrs. from teachers, that was a perfect example of this. Mm -hmm. the, uh, in fact, the left says th this notion that we're the authority and you're the student, yeah. oh, that's nonsense. Yeah. It, it, Which begs it, it the pervades. question, why are we paying you then? <laughs> it does beg that question. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. apropos brotherly love, brothers are almost paradigmatically agonistic. Right. I mean, right. Cain and Abel... Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, so that doesn't necessarily <laughs> solve the problem. Brothers, right. mm -hmm. But it's, tr it's mm -hmm. true for every. It's fractal. You can't re like. What music do you listen to? Mm -hmm. Do you choose? Do you indiscriminately yeah, right, pick something? Exactly, what yeah. book do you read? Where do you put your attention? Well, when Where I do you want to What restaurant do you want to go to? They yeah, have right. an answer. It's interesting. So I would say to them. So let me uh, ask you something. So, uh, so Superman comics are on the same level as Dostoevsky, and caller. This is. Decades ago, caller after caller would tell me on my radio show, yes, it's, I prefer Superman, Dennis, Subjectively you defined. prefer Dostoevsky. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah. It's, it, there's no better or worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and the thing, I think that's often motivated by two things. It's, it's motivated by an unbelievable lack of differentiated taste. And so that's, that's a sin in, in and of itself. I think a sin against beauty. And it's also, also motivated by a desire to dispense with responsibility because... You know, you might say, well, everything's equal because I believe in the brotherhood of man. It's like, no, no, everything's equal because you don't want to do the bloody work necessary to move you, move yourself up a valid hierarchy. That's right, and right. even within an artistic community where openness is in some ways the predominant of all the traits, you can't have that perspective. So, no. when, so if you if you give without notes destroying to, the community, if you give somebody notes on something and they say, "Well, that's the way that I like it," and everything's subjective, it's like everything is not subjective. No. There's a point maybe if you achieve a certain level of expertise and you're getting notes, let's say on your novel, where your opinion can hold equal sway, but there's objective things that can be told to you about ways that it can be improved. Well, and so having an artist genre that would be. We've talked about this before. I mean, you have to satisfy this constraints of the reading community because maybe they're not going to buy your damn book. But you also have to abide by the traditions of the genre, right? So you have a contract with the genre. That's like the spirit of the genre. And you have a contract with your readers. And the source of what is valid criticism is actually that it reflects that horizontal, or, or that, sorry, that vertical alliance with the standards of the genre itself and also with the implicit contract that you're making with the reader. Right, it's not you, arbitrary at if, all. Right, and if you are a master of a form and you want to play with the fringe, remember Picasso could yeah. paint gorgeous realism, right, but he was a master of, the, of, of a form who then decided to play and take liberties. Right. You can't start and have that position. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can't start and have a claim that like whatever you think, we're all playing in a high openness artist game. Uh, everything's down to a matter of opinion. Yeah. And it's not. There's objective um, rules. There's objective apprenticeship. And so it destroys art also. Value. Yeah, but it art, destroys yeah, even yeah. a field in which openness is one of the prevailing right. It probably values. destroys it, it more rapidly than anything else, interestingly enough, because all the artist has on his side, given that he's a fringe figure, is the, the reality of an objective quality that his fringe activity is bringing to that, the true that life. That was true. <laughs> well, it that, was true. Well, that's true. Today, he has something else on his side. The New York Times art page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Right, right, right. right. But as soon as you ally yourself with ideology, you're done as an artist. Yeah. Because you're subordinating the only yeah. thing that then you're going. Then you're creating propaganda. Yeah. It's a different yeah. game. Yeah. Awesome. To, to bounce off what uh, Dagel said about the fratricidal, Metternich said very famously at the time of the French Revolution that when he saw what the French brothers did to brothers, if he had a cousin, he said, I'm sorry, if he had a brother, he said he would call him cousin. Right, right. <laughs> well, you know, Douglas, it also might be the fact that that fratricidal tendency is exacerbated because the hierarchical relationship between brothers is actually in question. So you can imagine if they had established a relationship where the hierarchy was clear, hierarchy of quality, maybe you do this when you establish an adult relationship with your brother. You know, you see that he's got his domain of specialization and the value he brings to that, and you have yours, and so there's no struggling for position like Jacob and Esau struggled because that's taken care of. But the reason it's taken care of, this is always the case between people, is that there's a proper hierarchy of rank is established and everybody accepts the principles by which that hierarchy of rank maintains itself. That is a precondition for peace. I mean, one of the things I tried to stress in my lectures, because so many more radical types come after me because I'm, like, pro-hierarchy. It's like, well, I knew. You see this in the animal kingdom constantly, is that animals will fight to maintain their hierarchy even if they're at the bottom of the ranks. And the reason for that is animals know full well that full-out bloody war is way worse than just having to subjugate yourself so in a lower manner. So this is perfect. The answer for me... Given, given your true expertise uh, in, in, uh, in certainly in, in psychology, I don't relate. I relate to a lot of awful tendencies like anybody can. But I don't relate to the idea that I don't want my teacher, for example, to be the authority in the classroom. What does that emanate from? Narcissism. Because what narcissists want is unearned reputation. So it's right. narcissism. Yeah, you bet. It's because it's, it's, I want all the advantage of, of having the position of authority without having to do any of the work necessary to establish the authority. It's worse than that, Dennis. Like the real, narc the real devious narcissists, they, do, they go way farther than that. They want to destroy the idea of authority and competence itself because that's actually the impediment to their movement up an arbitrary uh, attentional hierarchy. They want all the attention. That's a narcissist. All the attention... None of the sacrifice. Mm. I think there's something else going on, Dennis, too, that there's, along with this sort of theory of teaching, is a, is a theory of truth. So as I understand it, this sort of revolution in the philosophy of education that shifts from thinking of the teacher as a sort of figure of authority in the center of the classroom and more like a kind of midwife facilitating mm. ideas and thoughts out of the young is built on this idea that, that basically truth is, is subjective, or at least there right, isn't so a capital. Right, so how can there be an authority? There's no capital T truth. There's no capital T teacher. Mm -hmm. Question. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Um, so you say narcissism, right? So, mm -hmm. so what, what do you do when that is a condition that's cultivated by the culture and people are young and they're occupying that you space? fall into the pit and the earth slams. Shut. <laughs> yeah. but, but how do you engage? How do you engage then generationally? Oh, let's say there's a Look. lot of young people who it, they're not narcissists, Look. but their skin is so fragile. Oh, okay, so one of the things this has, things, this, this has happened time and time again in, in my public lectures. It's part of what has made them popular is that I ask the young people, let's say the audience, it's like, are you in the Garden of Eden? No, we're suffering like mad. It's like, yeah, you're suffering like mad. Okay, so what are the genuine antidotes to that suffering? Think about it. Where do you derive the antidote? Well, imagine this. You establish a, a credible relationship with your intimate partner. You take responsibility for that, for that relationship. And maybe you take responsibility for the relationship with your siblings. And maybe you take responsibility for the relationship with your business partners. And what you find is the meaning, that the meaning you need is to be found in responsibility. That's the antithesis of narcissism. And it's this, I think, one of, one of the things that I've cottoned on to, let's say, is the power of the, the strange power of this juxtaposition. Because the, the fringe spokesman would say, responsibility is tyranny, like mandatory responsibility is tyranny. And there's something in that. If I force you to do something, even if it's a good thing, the force eradicates its utility. But, but what the people who only stand, especially if they're narcissistic, for the fringe don't understand is that almost all the meaning that people find in their life, the true meaning is derived from the voluntary the voluntary willingness to bear responsibility. And my sense is, it's so interesting to watch this because 
This happens in virtually every lecture that I do. There's a moment where I talk about the nexus between meaning and responsibility, and without fail, in hundreds of theaters around the world, that brings the audience to dead silence, always. And it's like, a, it's like a little revelation, and I think, well, why is that a revelation? And I think the answer is, no one's made that case in our society in a compelling way for 60 years. It's like, where's the meaning? In self-actualization, in creative pursuit, in the freedom of the desert. It's like, well, maybe if you're in a tyranny, and that's the case. stepping into your own power. Yeah, but no, I think, I think right. that, or, or that Stephen, you say to people, no, it's actually the voluntary adoption of responsibility. And that's, the, and they go, that's, and that's covenantal because that's covenantal. Free, it must be freely entered. Yeah, and, it's, and it's to yeah. be found in relationship, mm -hmm. right? But you can see it like what Stephen Blackwood is doing at Ralston. It's, uh, I mean, it's wild because we have this sense where you know, <laughs> we've been told that you have to entertain everybody. Everybody has to be comfortable. Everybody has to have everything the way that they need it so that, so that they're fine. And Ralston is saying, we're going to do something you're going to suffer. It's going to be extremely hard. We're going to we're going to give our hundred percent. We're going to give everything we've got for you, and you have to give everything you've got back. Mm -hmm. And then they can't deal with the amount of people. Mm -hmm. And people are so thrilled when they have that opportunity. I mean, we I went to Greece to see to, to see the new class, and the, the the students there who were very carefully selected were so thrilled to be there they could hardly even stand it, and it was because they were being offered. Well, at least in part, the adventure of their life. And they were working, man. They were working, like, flat out all day. It was very difficult. Taken out of their land, like Abraham, moved to a foreign land, like, offered this adventure. And they were just absolutely thrilled about it. The Germans so. have a wonderful adage. Wer fordert, fördert. And that translated means, whosoever makes a demand, so to fordern is to make a demand, Furthered. It's literally furthers, i.e., mm -hmm. the teacher who is really exerting, ex who, who is demanding something from the pupil, that is the teacher who is really stimulating and, uh, and encouraging, uh, encouraging mm -hmm. transforming the, the, mm -hmm. the, the pupil in the good way. Absolutely. And um, but I saw this all the time when I was an undergraduate teacher, you know, because the students would come in at, with a veneer of cynicism. And, and the veneer had been well cultivated by 13 years of sitting in, an, in, in a desk being lectured to by, you know, bureaucrats. And so they had this surface cynicism. But, and it was easy to bounce off that, but it was easy to get underneath it. And the way you got underneath it was straightforward. Well, you know this, you know this, Douglas, is that you get uh, underneath it by offering the op them the opportunity for a genuine intellectual adventure and a genuine sacrifice. It's no, you don't understand. There's something you really need here. You really need this. But you're going to have to do the damn work to get it. But it's worth it. And students, they're so, even the cynical ones, they are so relieved when they encounter something like that happening. They're on your side instantly if you're doing it genuinely. This is why John Verveke, for example, at the University of Toronto was so spectacularly successful because that's exactly what he offered the students. It's like, no, no, here's an actually meaningful pathway. It's going to take some damn work. Like, it's not something that you can just apprehend in, in a second like some half-wit ideology. You're going to have to transform yourself to manage it. But students are so thrilled when that happens. It's one of the great things about, about being an undergraduate teacher. Yeah, I know. I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Yeah. All right, so Numbers 20. Moses strikes the rock, and Aaron dies. Numbers 21. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin. Are, are we doing any more on the striking of the rock? It, yep, we it's coming up right now. Right now. Right yeah. now. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the land, Lord! And why have you brought the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have you made us to come out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed or figs or vines or of pomegranates. Neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle. And they fell upon their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, 
and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron, thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, and thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. So Moses can extract water from even a rock with his voice, the voice of God. Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Okay, so what's happening here? Well, I'll, I'll just reiterate it very briefly. So, the people are all squawky again because they're whining away and they're pining for e Egypt and they're complaining that they haven't got what they want this second and so they're murmuring away. And... Uh, God and Aaron, or Moses and Aaron, go to the congregation. They fall on their faces again, so that's an act of humility. God appears to Moses and says, Tell the rocks, speak to the rocks, use your voice, uh, use your words, and uh, the rock will, and water will spring forth out of the rock. Moses is a master of water. But that isn't what Moses does. He gathers the whole congregation together and he uses this rod, that's his staff, right? And he, and he whacks the rock, and water does come out, but that isn't what God told him to do. And anyways, it ends with the Lord, this section, the Lord saying to Moses and Aaron, Because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring the congregation into the land which I have given them. Now I talked to Jonathan about this a bit, and we can start with this, that like the rod of Moses is something like his authority, his staff, right? And he... By striking the rock, it's as if he, he forces it to reveal water instead of using his words, which, and that's more emblematic of something like, well, he, he, God enjoined him to use his words and not force to bring water out of the rock, and Moses uses force. That's one reading of this, and so... It's, I'll, like, I'll, pe it's like people who use truth as a hammer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, can, can you do the right thing by force? And the well, here I, it's is perhaps really not. important to note that he was told to use the rod in Exodus. So the sin is not that he spoke and did and uh, did that he hit and didn't speak because he was already commanded in the exact same situation earlier in Exodus to use the rod to hit the rock by God. God said, "Hit the rock." Mm -hmm. It is, it is totally understandable that people think his sin was that he uh, hit and didn't speak. His sin is not that. This I, I am certain of. I, I hate to even speak like that. But I got this from the great Jacob Milgram. This is not my own understanding, but the moment I heard it, I knew he was right. It is that that he said, watch how Aaron and I will bring forth water. Okay. Fine, that fine. was the sin. Mm -hmm. Not God, us. Yeah, must we I, fetch water out of the Yes, rock? that's what the sin was. Yeah. But could it be also that the image of hitting the rock, it's almost an image of the fact that he thinks he's going to do it himself. Because he is... But he did it in Exodus. Right, but, but maybe, that was, maybe that was the right... Like, there is a time to use authority, and they're a lot more lost in the first part of that. Like, so, so like, I, I appreciate the, the additional... Transformation, the idea that he that he's taking that authority onto himself, that's a very bad idea. And it's no wonder that's a big And that's sense. why he's not allowed into Israel. Mm. Because God understood but, now he is saying he is godlike. They will worship him if he gets them right. into Israel. But do, Dennis, do you think there's do you think the idea that he's hitting the stick the rock with the, with his staff is actually kind of hammering that point home? is because Moses is also using authority rather than his words, and that seems to me a parallel had in the he, narrative structure. My, my take uh, uh, is that had he not said the words he did, that were the sources of the water, not God... That would have been bad enough. It would have been... Yeah. It would have been but, okay. that, that, yes, that's right. But it, that it, was the sense. Dennis, in the sense that he knew that he had done it before. 
Exactly. This is how I did it before. Yes. So now God told him how to do it, and he's like, no, I've done this before, and I'm going to do it the way I, I know how to do it. So right. that's what I mean, that hitting the rock, even in narratively, is a reflection of the fact that he thinks that he's the one doing it. Right. It's also a danger, you know, that's a danger that's very common in mythological representations of ossifying heroes, mm -hmm. right? And it's this idea that, you know, to be the redeeming hero means to exist on the edge of chaos and order. It's a very tight edge, and the problem is, is that as you get older as an authority figure and you've done all sorts of things in the past, there is this temptation to assume that you can just replicate what you've already done. And so there seems to be an echo of that. Or shorthand it. Just yeah. believe me, because I said so. Like, just trust right, me I've this time. I've done this before. But I have a, I have a question, because there's a terrifying notion that's baked into this, and I'm curious what your take on it is from the interpretation you've given, which is if Moses is the meekest man on earth, and even he has this sin of pride, then... No, it wasn't a sin of pride. Well... It was a... It, Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll, so let's say it's a sin of overstepping his boundaries and oh, claiming it, it, glory for himself yes, rather than taking it Even from though God. that's not what he meant. He, they just said, this is right after Korach's rebellion, they just said, you're no better than anybody else. So he says, oh really? Watch, we'll get water out of this rock. He mm -hmm. didn't mean to say, we, not God. Rather, we, not you. But it didn't matter. It came out as we, not God. But it's really saying Moses is that in yeah. this whole thing. Like it's, Moses really. But that's not just a slip of the it. tongue. Right? That's right. You're right. Doesn't deserve. Is that what you said? Yeah. You think Moses doesn't deserve what God? Does. Oh no, he doesn't deserve it. But God was right uh -huh. because had he done gotten away with that and gotten them into Israel, they would have worshipped him. That's why mm -hmm. he's buried where no man can find him, so that he will never be worshipped. He really is pro Moses. Yes, yeah, that's for that's sure. Right. And pro that's God, by the way. Yeah. 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 I just want to. I want to make that yeah. clear, yeah. Dennis. To be yeah. to be to be clear, though. So you're saying it literally was a slip of the tongue. Yes, yeah. but but an understandable one in light of what they had just said. Oh, you're no better than. Oh, really? No so better. You don't watch. Think, we'll get water out. So there's nothing about his claim because Jonathan's interpretation is a little bit that he's bringing the glory to himself, right? And he so is, a, but it wasn't the... Re yes, he but is. You say not he not, not so vis-a-vis -vis God, vis-a-vis -vis them. Yeah, but your I, point is even if he does it inadvertently, that's it's, so, it's so egregious an error that he doesn't get it, to Right, be. so here's Prager's theory on life. God does not punish us in this life for bad things. He punishes us for foolish things. Oh. The bad is punished in the next world. Mm. The foolish is public but I, punished I think in this world. If you take the biblical That's narrative. the way life works for most of us. The Hitlers of the world don't get punished in this world. But we at this table, we get punished for foolish things. Because we're not an evil group. Mm. I mean, that's fair to say. So far. But the, the, so. if you take the narrative of Scripture itself, like if you take the whole narrative of Scripture from Genesis all through, there's a sense in which God gives us something. And as soon as we grab it for ourselves, that's the sin. That's the sin. That's the sin in the garden, right? There's, there's this tradition that, that God was ultimately going to give Adam and Eve the fruit if they had just waited to receive it from God. But because they take it for themselves, that's what makes it the sin. So Moses, the same, like God the whole time is saying crazy things to Moses. He's like, you'll be God to Aaron, I'll be God to you. Like, that's some pretty intense things to tell someone. But then as soon as Moses grabs it for himself, and he forgets where it comes from, then it falls. It's the same with the calf, right? There's nothing wrong with a golden calf in itself. Right, there'll be there'll be bronze ca uh, calves, bulls in the temple. It's the direction where if, it, if you try to grab it for itself, as soon as you do that, then it dissolves like in your sons, hands. So we right. saw in the last episode, yeah. just like Aaron's sons. Yeah, just, just like Aaron's sons, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I don't know. I see it as like a general narrative. Well. That's why no, I, that's I have thing. to see it. By that the way, way. I, yeah. I have another theory too on why did he hit it twice. So now I'm bailing God out. <laughs> So my theory on why he hit it, this is not Milgram, so I don't want to blame him for this. Uh, he hits it for the first time, nothing happens. I think that was God's way of saying, Moses, you hit it and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Maybe you did something wrong. Right. So there's a bit of a doubling down. A, a bit of a, of a giving him a second chance. Mm -hmm. No, but on Moses' part. Oh, he yes, twice. that's right, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, all right, so... Let's do Numbers 20, 13 to 24. Oh, in Numbers 20, 13 to 24, 
We just finished 12. Um, Edom refuses to let Israel pass. And so, Jonathan, you had a bit of a comment about well, that. I just, I just wanted to mention the importance of understanding how Edom and Moab will play a large part of the problems that they have in the wilderness. And we always have to remember that Edom is Esau. Edom is the descendants of Esau. And so it's as if in the problem of not, being, not entering into the Promised Land the way they were supposed to, they fall back into this brotherly conflict that they had with Esau. And then the same, the sin of Moab, or the, 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 let's say the confusion of Moab, which is Moab are the descendants of, the, of, of Lot and his daughters, is going to plague them in their wilderness. So it's as if, like, the, let's say the, the sins of Genesis or the problems of Genesis, now that they are not moving towards the Promised Land, are going to reappear for them in this, mm-hmm. through the peoples that descend from, from, from them. And it's the same with like the, 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 the Anakim that we talked about before. It's like the, now they're in the wilderness and, and like they're, going, they're, they're going to face giants. Like all of Genesis is brought back into Exodus. We have to see them as functioning together. I really think so. So the emergence, so let's, use, let's call that generational trauma, right? Yeah, Use yeah, the yeah. term. And... Their, their, their loss of their moral connection with their past to render it properly has now brought the sins of the past through the lineage. That's a good way to see it, yeah. I okay. think so. Okay. All right, so, so the Israelites are trying to move forward and Edom refuses to let them pass and we pick it up here. And this is Numbers twenty twenty four. Aaron shall be gathered unto his people. And this, this is the death of Aaron. For he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because you rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Take Aaron and Eleazar his son, and bring them up unto Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments, and put them upon Eleazar his son. And Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, and shall die there. And Moses did as the Lord commanded, and they went up into Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments. So he's stripping him of his role Mm. as mediator between Moses and the people. And put them upon his son. And Aaron died at the top of the mount. And Moses and Eleazar came down from the mount. And when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, they mourned for 30 days, even all the house of Israel. Pretty damn rough, eh? Because Aaron has been... Now, he's being useful, and, you know, you compare yourself to him at your peril, and yet this sin that we just described seems to be so egregious that not only does he die, but he's really, he's really publicly humiliated, stripped of his garments in front of the whole community. All of that's given to his son, and then he dies. That's pretty damn miserable. And so whatever's happening when Moses strikes the rock, we've had a bit of, you know, a bit of a... Uh, kerfuffle about it, let's say, although we seem to have agreed that it has something to do with, with, um, with, with Moses and Aaron's incaution in taking to themselves what is properly God's. That, and and that, that's enough of a, of a sin here that Aaron, who's been a pretty good servant of God, uh, meets a rough end. But do you have to take it a harsh way like that? I've always read it that he was getting on anyway. And uh, he wasn't going to, that, the punishment is not going to enter the promised land. And but you the, think he's gathered, he's gathered into God's so bosom nonetheless. Land. This is a way of succession from father to son. I've always taken it. I, I get, if you, but if you look at verse 24, he says, you know, Aaron won't get us enter the land because you rebelled against my word That's at the water the of Meribah. Yeah. Nor does Moses. Mm. Yeah. So the then, would you say that it's them, descriptive like, then rather than normative? Yeah. Yeah. That this is just. I mean, away. it suggests Dennis is onto something Nobody because Aaron did. is not the one who he bears the consequences of something. It's not the striking of the rock, or it's it's the it's the claim that we. Uh, it says we. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I, I'm Moses beginning to side with the, Dennis here a little Moses bit. Moses makes the claim, not Aaron. No, so, they both make the well. It you, says, but Moses well, made it on both of their names, though. Yeah, right? Yeah. But Aaron we will get. We don't know if Aaron was like either. elbow him, being like, "Yo, <laughs> Moses!" Like, <laughs> by the way, I think thing. Oz's thing that's fascinating. It, it, you could really read it as humiliated, or as, "Look, your son is taking your mantle." Mm-hmm. What could be more beautiful than that for a father? But it's not him. It's not Aaron who's giving his son right. his vestments. It's Moses who's stripping Aaron. 
and giving it to right, his son. Right, and Moses is the divine I I authority in this situation. So I think it's, it's, so it's, tragic. it's your, your temperamental, your it's wonderful temperamental thing. optimism is shining through <laughs> that interpretation. I don't know. So, if Moses took my talk show and gave it to my son, I, I would... You I, think that'd be, I, I, that'd be okay I, I with you? Be very yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is there something of the <laughs> terrifying, inscrutable God... I mean, I'm just throwing this out mm -hmm. here as a, as a question for the others here, because we've emphasized the goodness of God throughout our reading, mm -hmm. and I think we've wanted to engage in some kind of uh, justification <laughs> for uh, divine uh, action in the narrative. Um, but of course, there's the wonderful lines in, in Job 38, where uh, God answers poor old Job, who's had a really tough time, uh, you know, out of the whirlwind, who is this that darketh counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me, where wast thou when, when I, I laid the, the foundations? Right, right, right. I mean, I so that, that sense of, you know... Yes. Certainly an implacability, no. right? Well, so. yes, there's a great Hebrew saying that has comforted me all of my life. Three words in Hebrew. Lu yedativ hayitiv. If I knew him, I'd be him. It's very well, that's Nietzsche, too. There's also, if this is for God, how could I bear not to bear God? Th there's also, I think, a sense here in which this is exactly the antidote, both for Aaron and for the people, of the sin that Aaron has committed, right? You know, taking that onto themselves, you know, pretending they're the, the God and not God. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the answer to that is radical humility. And in this case, it's a kind of humiliation because... The people have to know. Aaron himself needs. There's a certain sense in which I think you see the kind of purification of Aaron himself. There's this. There's this public demonstration that it was the garments that were representing God's, let's say, vocation given to him that were what made Aaron, you might say, a great figure, not Aaron himself. And so you take those off as a way of publicly showing the way forward not to be uh, to commit the sin as Aaron and Moses have. But that's but the also difference between the prophet and the priest, isn't it? The prophet is a person in his own right. The priest is the one who wears the uniform. Mm -hmm. Well, also, this is true, I mean, our lives... Hence the uniform. Yeah, hence the uniform. You start drinking your own Kool-Aid thinking, oh, you know, look at me, I do all this, and I've got this, and I've got these gifts, and these talents, yep. and these achievements, and... That's right. Watch out! You right? confuse yourself. You with confuse your role. yourself, and that, that your pride comes from a fall in a profound yeah. way. And I think the antidote that that to that, both moment moment to moment, and in radical ways when we need it ourselves, as we all do, is precisely the the the. That's why Christians keep Lent and and and, 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 and Jews have their ascetic holidays, and other traditions have them because you need re repetitively, you might say ritualistically, to return yourself. To yeah. the to the base dependence well, we, on what is beyond. Well, we you. also note that many times in the text, when the people depart from God's pathway, He forgives them, and 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 things continue. The covenant is modified, but there's here a radical transformation. Is that whatever Aaron did is so egregious that he can't transform and him his way out of it. He actually has to be replaced. Not only replaced, but replaced. He has to be replaced, and he has to die. And so that's a pointer again to the importance of whatever is happening when Moses strikes the rock with the, with the, with the staff. It, it's, uh, there's no way out of this for Aaron except to move his authority to a new person and to depart. So, but there's two bad things here. He doesn't get to the promised land and he dies. Right. The text says the first is a punishment. It doesn't say the second is. You're all interpreting it rather harshly, I think. The second is much more, he's, I mean, he's an older brother. We don't know how much older he was. I don't think the second is necessarily, his death is not capital punishment, to put it bluntly. I, I wouldn't have interpreted this capital punishment, but it doesn't seem to me, it doesn't seem to me to be We need a new priest, if there's a hereditary principle in the selection of the priesthood, <laughs> you've got to die for your son to take mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any, clo any closing comments on this? Jonathan, any, anyone else? 
All right. Well, this is, we're going to go to Numbers 21, and that ends Numbers for us. This is a killer story, to say the least. It's one of the strangest and deepest stories that, that I've been privy to stumble over in this text, let's say. We'll start with Numbers 21.4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake up against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. I assume that's the manna. So they're not very happy with heavenly bread again. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, that's a dragon, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now there's a couple of very interesting spin-offs of that story. I'll start with a clinical interpretation. And, and then there's a very interesting reference to this story in, in the Gospels. And I'll maybe let Jonathan start with that. So, this story is extremely interesting from a narrative and a clinical perspective. Because maybe this wouldn't be as powerful narratively, but it would have made sense, you know. So the, the Israelites are getting all uppity again and faithless and they're worshipping Egypt and they're squawking and bitching away and they're sick of heavenly bread, which is pretty pathetic, and they're not coming across well here again. And so God sends in snakes. And I think the reason for that, from the psychological perspective, is that, you know, you're in the desert and you don't have food and water, but you're not that smart and there's some stupid things you could do and you will do, that will even make it worse. And so they squawk and complain and murmur. Now, they not, now not only do they not have the bread they want or the water, but now they have snakes biting them. And that's life, that's for sure. And so, and then, not because they're good, but because there's too many snakes, they decide, well, you know, maybe we're not that stor sorry, but we better go apologize to God and Moses, because, like, look at all the snakes. And, and so they get Moses to intercede, gr begrudgingly, I would suspect, I I mean, on the part of the people. And what God does is so strange. It's so remarkably strange. Because he could have just got rid of the serpents. He sent the damn things. And it, it's an echo for me of why there's a snake in the Garden of Eden, by the way. Like, wh why does God put the snake there? It's the Garden of Eden. You need a snake? And the answer to that might be yes, or that it's inevitable. But instead of just getting rid of the snakes, he does this very strange thing. He tells Moses to make an, to make an image of a snake, a fiery snake, so a dragon, a fire-breathing serpent, and he tells the people that if they come and look at the fire-breathing serpent, the snake, the poisonous snake, if they look upon it, that they will now be protected from the poison of the snake. And I thought, when I, when I figured what this, uh, what this meant psychologically, I thought, oh my God, that's exposure therapy. That's exactly what it is. So in the clinical realm, over the last hundred years, clinicians of all stripes have agreed upon a few things. And one of them is that helping people voluntarily confront that which is poisoning them is curative. And it's not curative because it makes them less afraid. It's curative, and this has been worked out in great technical detail. It's not that they habituate to the danger. That's not what happens. It's that they become braver by voluntarily gazing on that which poisons them. And then that bravery generalizes. And so the actual the actual redemptive process forward is to gaze voluntarily upon the things that poison you while you're along the way. And that's so, that's so absolutely remarkable. One of the things you do as a therapist is you calibrate the size of the serpents. You know, you don't want to make 
you know, you don't want to expose a three-year-old to a 50-foot dragon, but you kind of find a serpent that's about the right size. But the upshot, the Freudians will have you walk through the pathology of your past and confront that, right? And the narrative therapists will do the same thing, the cognitive therapists and the behaviorists take something you're afraid of like an elevator and expose you to it gradually. And you don't get less afraid. And we know that because to begin with, the behaviorists would have people relax, like they do breathing exercises, because the idea you were counter-conditioning them against fear. So you were afraid. You had to see the terrible thing and learn to relax. But then they learned real soon you didn't have to teach anybody to relax. It didn't make a bad damn bit of difference. You just had to put them on the edge. And so that voluntarily con voluntary confrontation with poisonous catastrophe strengthens you. And so now there's still serpents, but they can't poison you. And that's even a better deal because, well, there are serpents. And so maybe the mother can chase away all the serpents, right? But then the mother's the serpent. And so you want to fortify your people. You want to make them strong. And that's what's happening symbolically here. And that's so damn brilliant. It's amazing that it's encapsulated in this story. But then there's an even weirder twist. And I'll get Jonathan to start the comment on this because Christ says of himself in the Gospels that he has to be lift, lifted up like this brazen serpent in the desert. And that's a very strange thing for someone to say because why would Christ assimilate himself to, of all things, a serpent on a post? And then why does he say that he has to be lifted up? And I think the answer to that is that part of what the gospel story does, the passion of Christ, is it aggregates all the serpents. It's like the gospel, the, the passion of Christ is a, at minimum, it's an account of all the terrible things that could possibly happen to you in your life if all the terrible things that could happen in a life happened to you. So it's like, it's all the serpents. The crucifixion is all the serpents at once. It's betrayal and it's death and it's torture and it's unjust death and it's being uh, selected for death over a criminal and it's betrayal of your best friend. It's like everything. And the idea there is that if that is confronted voluntarily and radically accepted, it's simultaneously transcended. And the fact that those narratives stack on top of one another, and they do that because of this reference that Christ makes back to the serpent, is just, I just can't believe that. It's absolutely beyond comprehension. Can I just quickly ask, if, speaking as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a clinician, what does that mean? Let's say you mentioned betrayal. Let's say someone is terrified or afraid of betrayal. What does it mean to confront it? To confront it. Practically, well, how do you, how do, you well, do that? Part, part, of it, part of it is you do it, you do it practically. You, you get the details of the story. Exactly what happened. Exactly how did this occur. Look at every single detail. Then you help people think, were there weaknesses in your approach that made it more likely that this would occur? So, for example, maybe there's a history of you being betrayed. It's happened to you four times, and it's taken you out each time. It's like, well, once... It's the other person. Twice, it's the other person. Three times, it's you. And so then often what you find in therapy is that people who are betrayed repeatedly are far too trusting and naive. They're too childlike. They're too dependent. They haven't looked on enough serpents in their life. They don't have the eyes of... They're, they're all dove and no snake. And so they get betrayed all the time. And so you help them. And then you also help them contend with the fact of the potential that they could betray people. So there's that, that evil within them like Harry Potter being, you know, touched with, with the soul of Voldemort and being able to talk to snakes, they have to make contact with that possibility within them. And then generally they have to learn to be aggressive. Because people who are naive and then are lay themselves open to psychopathic manipulation generally don't have any aggression incorporated within them. So they also have to confront the idea of the serpent within. And so that's part of the way you would step Can you step finish that your sentence? Having people gaze upon what frightens them Please finish the sentence. It's, it's fortifies awesome. them. Fortifies, fortifies them. them. And, and, and that's the, that. See, the, the behaviorists faced opposition from the psychoanalysts when they first implemented exposure therapy. The psychoanalysts said, look, they say they're afraid of an elevator, but really they're, the elevator is only a symbol for something like death. And so you, if you teach them to not be afraid of the elevator, a death fear will just pop up somewhere else. You'll get symptom substitution. And so there's a big argument in the psychological community about this. But what happened is, that isn't what happened. But here's why. This is so cool. So I had a client who was afraid of an elevator. And so what we did, first of all, I had her look at pictures of elevators. And that was enough for her for a while. And then we'd go out in the hallway, and she'd stand like 100 feet away and just look at an elevator. And the rule was, walk near the elevator till you're nervous, stop, and then just wait till you're not nervous. But look at the damn elevator. You have to... 
when you take someone inside an elevator, they'll look at their feet. You have to say, no, no, you've got to look at the numbers, you know, the, the display where you are. You have to look at the control panel. You have to investigate with your central vision every element of what you're avoiding. Because otherwise you won't accustom yourself to it. You won't get braver. And so then you just put the person on the edge. And then maybe by three sessions, they're like right next to the elevator. So now I have my client right next to the elevator, and she hasn't done that for years. I said, look, you have to establish a relationship of trust before you can do this. I said, look, I'm going to push the door. The doors are going to open, and then I'm going to hold the door. And I, I won't play any tricks. I'm not going to do anything to startle you, because that's a big mistake in those circumstances. I just want you to just look in, and that'll be enough for today. And so she looks in, and she goes, that's a tomb. And I thought, yes, that's exactly right, because... For her, see the fantasy for someone afraid, who's afraid of an elevator, it's very, very standard fantasy. I'll get trapped in there, the lights will go out, I'll start to have heart palpitations that are indication of a heart attack because lots of people who have elevator phobias have uh, panic attacks and they're afraid they're going to have a heart attack. I won't be able to get to the hospital and find a figure of authority, I'll die here. And it'll be even worse if there are people who are in the, in the elevator because I'll make a bloody fool of myself and humiliate myself and then I'll die. And so they get both fears, fear of social rejection and humiliation and of death. But so when, when they do encounter the elevator and walk in past the threshold, they are walking into the tomb. They're playing out the symbolic realm and the practical realm simultaneously. And that does generalize. And so one of the things you see very frequently in therapy, if you teach people to be more assertive, particularly happens with women, is that you know they're dependent and afraid, and so they're over-dependent on their husband. And so then their husband can tyrannize them. And so then you walk the woman through exposure therapy and she gets braver and then she'll go home and have a fight with her husband. And husbands often re resist the transformation because as the woman becomes braver by looking at the serpents, she's more willing to take on the tyrant in her husband. And then you get familial resistance to the movement of, towards health on the part of the client because, you know, maybe he's all accustomed to having this wife who, you know, never says boo. And that's not so good for him because she's not very interesting, but... You know, at least he gets to do whatever he wants whenever he wants. It's a stupid trade, but lots of people will make it. But it's so cool that, it's so cool that, well, that, that that's in this story, that there's, that's the best way to deal with serpents is not to get rid of them, but to look at them. Like, and God, we made the point so earlier, didn't we, another session, that this is why the whole safety culture yeah. in universities is so yeah. idiotic. I mean, yeah. trigger warnings yeah. and, yeah. I mean, that, you know, what can be, in a sense, more transforming in a deeply mm. spiritual sense yep. than yep. confronting the yep. inevitable suffering of the human condition. This is why I'm appalled by my professional colleagues. It's like they all know, all of them know, that not only is the idea that you should protect your students from triggers wrong, it's not just wrong. It's the opposite of what you should do. It's, it's not just it's a lie, crippling. it's an anti-truth. They all know that. Yeah. They won't come out and talk about it. There's some two, of them. There's two few. other little pieces I just wanted to comment on. One is that, again, it's like an inoculation, mm -hmm. right? So that's another level. You bet. Right, because you That's what a pharmacone is. It's a hair of the dog that bit you. Yeah. And the idea was a tiny bit of the poison right. will cure you. Right. Yeah. And the other thing that's really interesting in this is that, like you said, well, why doesn't he just get rid of all the snakes? And your analysis when you're talking about like habituation doesn't work and that you don't that you grow less afraid the fact is you grow stronger <laughs> and that's one of the things is when confronting something it's so interesting it's always with you your sins are always with you your flaws are always with you you grow up the other parts of yourself stronger in relation to mm -hmm, them right 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 and so if you take away the snakes it takes away the problem mm -hmm. but they're carrying away you, you have to carry that fear all the way through mm -hmm. and so much of this is about trying to figure out how to contain I mean the Israelites are, are they're like a they're like a, a dark victimy reflection of Pharaoh's stubbornness again and again and again mm -hmm. yeah, right yeah, yeah. it's it's the other version of that mm -hmm. but they have to grow another part of themselves bigger that part's always going to be there there's the golden calf and two minutes later you're striking the rod twice and two minutes later right the ground's opening up and swallowing people it's the other parts that have to be strengthened right well and it, well the and it, it's so it's so interesting because there's a there's, I don't remember what the study of, of the justification of suffering is called, um, you know, to justify God despite the fact that the world is rife with suffering. Theodicy. Like, theodicy. 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 Okay, yeah. so what's the theodicy is? No adventure without danger. 
Okay, but danger brings up the theodicy problem, right? If it's real danger, if it's real peril, what about the suffering of children? And the answer to, to that is something like, be better. Not, not have the danger go away, not make everything into a peaceful paradise where, you know, the naive can dance and play without fear. That's not it. It's something, it's something like, you know, form yourself into the guise of a holy warrior in the, in the most real sense so that you can contend with dragons, not so that they cease to exist. And it's so interesting, too, because you have this fundamental myth that's unbelievably old. Oldest story we have, I would say, it's told in every adventure story. Well, there's no dragons. Well, then, then there's no gold. Because it's always the dragon that, that hoards the gold. So does it mean, too, that if you get rid of the dragons, you make everything hyper safe? Is there's no gold? And that certainly seems to be the case. Is you take the spirit out of people by making things hyper safe, but you might also deprive them of the deepest treasure. And I do talk to my audiences about this around the world. It's like, do you want to be happy, satiated, comfortable, safe, secure? Like if you could have what you wanted. Is that what you want? And if it is, how is that different from just being a, an infant who's asleep? Because you don't even need to be conscious if that's your life. Because you just seek into unconscious when you, unconsciousness when you're satiated. That's what you do after a Thanksgiving meal. You want to be awake. Well, why? Because you have an adventure to undertake. Well, what's the adventure? Well, dragons everywhere, right? But the, if, the idea here would be if you can adopt the right attitude towards the dragon, the dragon transforms itself into gold. That's actually the story of the resurrection, most fundamentally, right? Is that if you gaze, if you accept your catastrophic destiny thoroughly, what you get out of that isn't death and humiliation and the descent into hell. What you get is the, the, resurre the eternal resurrection of the human spirit. And that's, that's, a, that's a walloping story because it turns out to be you see that in clinical practice over and over again, is that the person grows in proportion to their willingness to voluntarily confront the tragedy of their life. And then you might say, well, what if you did that completely? Like, I mean, I know it's a receding goal and an impossibility, but it still begs the question. If you took that all onto yourself, as voluntarily as you could, the whole bloody mess, as voluntarily as you could, do you simultaneously transmute it? And I mean, all the micro stories indicate that the answer to that is yes. So that's so the, that's something, man. This this story, I mean, it's probably it's one of the stories that I've thought about the most in my life. I wrote an entire play around the, the around the meaning of the story and how it. Uh, it's one of the stories that brought me to become orthodox. The, the, it's difficult to explain, but you know, until the beginning, since we started this, I, I'm trying to avoid always talking about Jesus. Like I, I, I do end up bringing him in. I'm sorry, but I try to avoid just smuggling. To, just <laughs> Jesus smuggling, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but this is a, a moment where I'm going to where I'm going to do it because I think that the story of the crucifixion is so difficult to understand. It is so. You look on that story, and it is so confusing. And we have an intuition. Some people have an intuition that there's something right about it, and we, we can kind of see it. But it's it's it wrecks everything in terms of our narrative. And we have a hint of that in the story of the bronze serpent in the Garden of Eden. God says, "Don't eat the fruit, or you will die." And then the serpent says, "If you eat the fruit, you will be like God." And in some ways, the secret is yes and yes. That's the secret. The secret is what you see in the story of Jesus is someone who is willing to eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil and die. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between him and Adam. Mm -hmm. And there are many images in the story of the crucifixion to show us that that's what he's doing. He's standing between a good thief and a bad thief. There, there are many images to show us that what he's doing is eating the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil and, and is willing to die. And then that death becomes glory. Um, well, you, see, you see that as a pattern too. I saw, there's this great medieval image that made an unbelievable impact on me when I saw it. And so it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life at the same time. And on the one side, there's Eve handing out skulls, apples, to people, and that's the distribution of death. And on the other side, there's Mary, who, who, who I think, actually, I think it's a representation of the true church in feminine form, and she's handing out wheat and hosts, and they're also fruits of the tree. Mm. And the idea there is that the, 
incorporation of the pattern of Christ's voluntary sacrifice is the medication for the death that's produced as a consequence of the fall. Yeah. And that's, yeah, and, and, and then to speak of that psychologically only, which is what I'll try to do here, is to say that, that the idea there is that the medication for the, ni the nihilism-inducing, despair-inducing catastrophe of tragedy is not to protect yourself from it or to veil yourself from it, to shield yourself from it, but to voluntarily confront it and investigate it in every painful detail, all of the catastrophe, and that paradoxically alleviates the catastrophe. But it's also redemptive, isn't it? I mean, I mean, I think Jonathan's absolutely right. It's kind of inevitable, particularly for Christians, to interpret that this kind of Christologically or kind of proleptically looking, looking forward, because that description of the Christ that of being lifted up as, as the serpent is followed immediately by possibly the most famous verse in the whole of the New Testament, John 3.16. So jo John's own explication is following, following that that lifting up phrase, one of three, I think, in the, in, in, in the New Testament, is God so loved the world that he gave his only son mm -hmm. that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Right, so, right. so it was a kind of a antidote here in numbers, an antidote to, to the poison, an antidote to the consequences of their wrongdoing. Well, but it's transmuted well, into eternal life at, uh, and, and salvation. In, well, with, in the with regards to the, to the idea, and correct me where I get this wrong, of the, of the Christological voyage in the Orthodox Church, my understanding of that psychologically is that the degree to which you are capable of acting in a redemptive fashion in the world, so following in the footsteps of Christ, let's say, archetypally, is precisely proportionate to the degree that you're willing to voluntarily confront and bear the suffering of life, then you think, well, you've got to think about that practically. It's like, well, how could that possibly be any different? Be, di how could it be any different than that? Because you do owe God a death, and you're going to be betrayed, and, and, and all of these catastrophes are, are implicit in your destiny, and, and then you kind of have, there's only two ways to go about that. One would be, well, I'm not paying any attention to that. That's for sure. But everyone knows perfectly well that how often do you solve a problem by not paying attention to it? Like everybody knows, pretending it's not there. Everybody knows that just makes problems multiply. So you, you have to confront a problem to solve it. And so then you might say, well, do you have to confront the problem of problems to solve it? And the answer to that could easily be yes. And then the question is, well, how radical could the solution be? And I would say, well, it seems clear to me from the people I've met who have acted in some redemptive capacity in the world that that's directly proportionate to their existential courage. Those, just, those things just seem like bound together inextricably. And so, well, well, I guess what that means in part is, well, the biblical stories have to be stories about us because, well, obviously, right, because they're stories about us. And then the question is, well, how deep does that go? And, and that brings us back to the idea, too, that we're all made in the image of God. You know, and, and that our, it's incumbent upon us to, to act that out in our life to the degree that we can. And, and then you might say, well, what's the ultimate consequence of acting that out ultimately? And the answer is, well, that's what you find out in your life. But who knows what the upper limit of that is? Certainly you know in the micro details that the people you admire spontaneously, the people even that you might be in awe of, are the people who have borne more than their share of the existential catastrophe of life. And they certainly gleam, their faces shine as a consequence of their capacity to do that. And sometimes unbearably, right? Because they're also simultaneously judges. That person has attained such stature that I'm embarrassed in his presence. There's no... I think those are just practical realities. So, it's a hell of a lot of information encapsulated in one little story. So, all right, gentlemen, if we're very careful, we can time this perfectly. On to Deuteronomy and the end of the Exodus seminar. I'll, I'll recount from Wikipedia again a brief description of Deuteronomy, and then we'll do two parts of it. The book of Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Torah. Chapters 1 to 30 consist of three sermons or speeches delivered to the Israelites by Moses on the plains of Moab shortly before they enter the Promised Land. The first sermon recounts the 40 years of wilderness wanderings, which had led to that moment, and ends with an exhortation to observe the law. The second reminds the Israelites of the need to follow Yahweh and the laws or teachings on which their possession of the land depends. 
The third offers the comfort that even should Israel prove unfaithful and lose the land, with repentance all can be restored. So that's a replication of something that we've already discussed, reward, punishment, and the possibility of redemption. The final four chapters contain the Song of Moses, the Blessing of Moses, and narratives recounting the passing of the mantle of leadership from Moses to Joshua, and finally the death of Moses on Mount Nebo. And so we'll start with Deuteronomy 30 which is Moses' warning. 30.11 For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us? that we may hear it and do it. But the v word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. It's so interesting that, you know, that searching up the vertical dimension in some way isn't, you're not going to find it there by exhorting the sky. You're not going to find it by going into the earth. You're going to find it, the very word is nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day, life and good, and death and evil. And that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, and his statutes, and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land, whether thou goest to possess it. But if those thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. I denounce you unto this day, and that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. And that's that pro-human injunction, right? That life more abundant. It's, it's a moral duty to celebrate and worship life itself despite its suffering. That thou and thy seed may live. It's an injunction to courage, existential courage. That thou, mayest love, lovest, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God and that thou mayest obey his voice and that thou mayest cleave unto him for he is thy life and the length of thy days that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. So Moses is reminding his people of their duty to the highest, to the association, and, and reminding them as well that there's an association between that and the very words that they, that they speak and abide by. And that's that primacy of speech, right? That's, a, that's an echo of the idea of the divine word, that, and, and the closeness of God to proper speech and accurate speech. And, and he says, too, that heaven and earth testified to that, right? So that we talked about that a bit, James, with the emergence of the logos upwards and the heavens and the logos of the heavens downward. And so it's a reminder. And then you, all, go, ahead, go ahead. I would say briefly, thinking of America with the Constitution coming from the Hebrew Covenant, this sort of a passage literally overwhelms me at times. I mean, in other words, America with all the specious forms of freedom, is at this point. And we're talking about today, as well as whatever. You mean this point in, in making this decision once again? Exactly. America needs to confront that. You can go one way or the other way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I read from a, 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 an American historian, and it blew my mind, and tragically for me, I read it right after I had already completed my commentary on Deuteronomy, the American founders, he did a, a systematic accounting of sources that the founders quoted from the Enlightenment, from the Greeks, the Romans, and from the Bible. All of them. Montesquieu was second from the French Enlightenment. Deuteronomy was number one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. The most quoted book. And, and Jesus quotes Deuteronomy more than any other book mm -hmm. except Psalms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, gentlemen, let's close with this. Right on time, by the way. The death of Moses, Deuteronomy 34. 
this great leader, he takes the Israelites out of tyranny, he, he, he guides them through the desert, he, and not only that, he sets up proper order while doing so, and then the, the very model of order itself, as it cascades down the centuries, the very model of order that those among us who have some degree of wisdom, uh, present company, company both included and excluded, um, have, have set up to guide ourselves with in, in the manner we just described. This great figure dies the death of Moses, and outside the promised land, right? Quite the catastrophe. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan. So he's up on this mountain. He can see possibility itself spread out before him. He can see what he's been journeying to all this time. God shows him that. And all Naphtali and in the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah, unto the utmost sea, right into the distance, and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, unto Zor. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swore unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher until unto this day. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. And so the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel, like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face in all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land and in all that mighty hand and all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. God buried him. I find this the most touching mm -hmm. sentence in the Torah. And the incredible contrast with Pharaoh. Okay. All that surrounds the Pharaoh, you think of King Tut and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and he's buried in in in, 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 mm -hmm. in, 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 in anonymity. Yeah. But then again, not, right? Because Moses' tomb is the book of Exodus, and it's outlasted and everything. Mm -hmm. Right, so, man so was... he got nothing and... And yet, the most permanent possible tomb imaginable. Yeah, where is the Pharaoh now? Right, the promise of the rod of Moses. We know of the Moses. Pharaoh, thanks to this book. Yeah, well, the, the promise of the rod of Moses devouring the rod of Pharaoh, which even right. now scholars today will mock as a bunch of, of a little tribe that is trying to make themselves better than Egypt. What is the story? The story is that, where is the Pharaoh now? Yeah. Right, that happened. Right, Egypt yeah. did convert. Egypt did turn to the God of, of, of Abraham. Well, if the rod, if the rod Isaac of, Jacob, if yeah. the rod of Moses is Mount Sinai, then it's devoured. Then we better pray it devours up all the serpents. <laughs> yes, indeed. Right. But the right. Torah begins. This is that I, I. Uh, anyway, the Torah begins with in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and ends with the word Israel. My, my take is the two great creations, the world and Israel. And Israel, that's we who wrestle with God. That's it. And, gentlemen, it's two, two hours on, on the dot, pretty much, with a minute there for a bit of fringe exception. And uh, that's that. We're going to reconvene and discuss for an hour what we've learned. For now, I'd like to thank everybody who's watching and listening to this 16-part walkthrough of Exodus. I'd like to thank the Daily Wire crew for making this possible, for having the faith on the, 
to, to double the length of this venture and to embark with us on this journey. And to everyone who's listening who's doing the same, I'd like to thank all of you for taking a substantial amount of time out of your busy lives. First on faith, to, that this might be an enterprise worth undertaking, and then in a spirit of real fellowship to complete it, because it's been a blast. And so, congratulations, men. We made it out of Israel. <laughs> <laughs>